Good morning. Um, this week's uh, lecture is going to be on pharmacology, and we're going to look at the, what what is pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics. Then we're going to look at the different medications that uh, we should be concerned about, mainly cardiac medicines. Okay. The people who are involved in um, moderate sedation, conscious sedation, um, you know, should pay special attention to these medications because we use um, some of these medications when we uh, put patient to, to sleep, so to speak. We compromise uh, uh, the, the, the patient, so we have to know how to monitor them. So you have to know a little bit about the, the, the medicines. Medicines that we're going to discuss includes uh, ACE inhibitors, which is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, and then HARBs. The, the HARBs is angiotensin II receptor antagonist. We're going to talk about beta blockers. Um, calcium channel blockers, digoxin, nitroglycerin, antiarrhythmic agents, uh, statins. <clears throat> we, we're going to look at some chemo, uh, chemotherapeutic agents only because they affect cardiac muscles. Um, the doxorubicin, adriamycin group of uh, 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 chemotherapies. Dobutamin, we use dobutamin to do stress tests atropine persantin adenosine and we, we we're going to look at um the medications that we use in conscious sedation such as um midazolam valium ketamine so we're gonna we, uh, and morphine so we we look at those medications as well so we'll spend about 30 40 minutes this morning uh, going over some basic uh, pharmacology, and then the next session will complete um, pharmacology. So when, when when we say pharmacology, you know we're going to do pharmacology this morning. What do we mean? So pharmacology is the interaction between drugs and a living organism, uh, because the the drug is going to affect the living organism. Is going to produce some some change and then the organism is also going to uh, convert the, the, the drug to or, or modify the drug in, in, to, to some extent. Um, some drugs are what we call pro-drugs. They are not active until they are introduced into the living organism. Then the living organism convert that pro-drug into an active drug. So it's just an interaction between a living organism and a drug. That's that's what pharmacology is in, in, in essence. And we divide pharmacology into pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. Uh, when we say pharmacodynamics, it's the effects of the drugs on a living organism. So, you know, you take, say, an analgesic, something that's take away pain, and so the drug take away the pain. That it, it, it produces certain effects on the, the, the living organism. So that's what we call the pharmacodynamics, what the drug do to the living organism. Then pharmacokinetics now is what the living organism, uh, how it affects the drugs. So when you give the drug, when you give someone a drug, it has to be absorbed, depending on where you give it. If you give it via the mouth, of course, you go into the, the GI tract, it may be absorbed. In, 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 in the oral cavity, in the mouth. It may be absorbed, you know, in, in the stomach. So there are going to be different areas of absorption. <clears throat> when you give a drug intravenously, you, you give it directly into the venous uh, system. So it circulates around. You give it intramuscularly. You give it into the muscles, and then it gets to the bloodstream and circulates. So when we talk about um, pharmacokinetics, we talk about the absorption of the medication, how the medication is distributed throughout the body, how it is metabolized, that's how it's broken down, and then how it's excreted. So these are all important uh, properties of, of, of drugs. 
but it's the organism, the, 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 the living organism, which is going to modify the drug in these situation, and that's what we call pharmacokinetics. Okay, so you know, there is when we talk about angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, you need to know a little about what we, the, the, the renin angiotensin system. And the renin angiotensin system is a very important system because it, it, it regulates blood pressure to a, a, a large extent. Okay. So this is one of the system that regulates uh, blood pressure and uh, the fluid status of, 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 of an individual. The first thing we get is, is renin, okay? Now, renin is produced in the kidneys. So renin is an enzyme which is produced in the kidneys. Then you have what we call angiotensinogen, Angiotensinogen is a is 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 a uh, a protein which is produced in the liver. So angiotensinogen is converted to angiotensin one by renin. Remember, we said renin is produced in the kidney. It's an enzyme. So it's gonna it's gonna work in this protein. It's gonna convert this angiotensinogen that is produced by the liver into angiotensin one. And then this angiotensin 1 is going to be converted into angiotensin 2 by an enzyme called ACE, angiotensin-converting enzyme. So this uh, angiotensin-converting enzyme is going to convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. And it is this angiotensin 2 which do a lot of bad things. Angiotensin 2... Uh, it, 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 it has receptors on the, 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 the vascular system, the arterioles, and it causes the arterioles to constrict. They, they get smaller, and that can increase the blood pressure. Angiotensin II also works on the kidney, what we call the adrenal cortex, to produce aldosterone, increase aldosterone secretion. And aldosterone uh, has a tendency to increase water absorption and potassium, okay? So uh, that's what uh, aldosterone usually do. Angiotensin II uh, also cause the reabsorption of uh, potassium. Sorry, it, it, yeah, it, 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 it inhibits potassium reabsorption. So it causes potassium to be eliminated from the body, okay? And it also increased the sympathetic nervous system. Now, the sympathetic nervous system is the fight and flight uh, system of the body. So, again, it's going to increase heart rate, it's going to make your, your blood pressure go up. So, these are the things that angiotensin II does. Okay? So, angiotensin II, which is produced in the body, you know, do a, 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 a lot of bad things. I mean, do some good things as well. But we think it is the main culprit, one of the main culprit to call, that cause hypertension, okay? Angiotensin II. So this angiotensin II, which is produced from angiotensin I, it acting, it acting receptors throughout the body. And of course, uh, we mentioned before, uh, arterial, the receptors in the arterioles, receptors in the kidneys, um, and then it also acts in the sympathetic nervous system. So if we can develop medications, if we can develop medications that can um, block the effect of uh, angiotensin II, Remember, we say angiotensin II is going to produce all these bad effects on these uh, organs. So if we can block the effect of angiotensin II, then we can prevent some of the bad stuff that angiotensin II does. And we have what we call angiotensin II receptor antagonists. I mean, we commonly call them HARBs, which is angiotensin receptor blockers. So these are medications that sits on the receptor and prevent angiotensin II from going on the receptor and producing its effect. So uh, it's angiotensin receptor blockers. 
sits on the receptor. So it blocked the activation of angiotensin II at the receptor level. So these medications sits on the receptors. So when the angiotensin II, which is circulating, goes to sit on the receptors, it is already occupied. So because it's going to block the effect of the angiotensin II, you get vasodilatation. The blood vessel dilates. <clears throat> it reduces uh, what we call vasopressin and reduces the production and secretion of aldosterone. So aldosterone does a lot of bad things. Uh, it causes salt and water retention and, and, and uh, potassium um, retention as well. So what are some of the medical uses for, for ARBs, which angiotensin II receptor blockers? We use it because it sits on the receptors, prevents vasoconstriction of the angiotensin II. It's one of our commonly used medication to treat hypertension. And studies have shown that it reduces kidney failures in patients with di diabetes. Remember, diabetics are prone to kidney failure. So it retards that process. And it also, your HARBs also is used in the treatment of heart failure, congestive heart failure. That is when you have a low ejection fraction. It, 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 it prevents what we call remodeling. And when you, when you have remodeling, you get thinning and dilatation of the, the heart muscle. Okay, that is one of the mechanisms for someone to develop a uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. You get thinning and dilatation of the heart muscle. The, the HARBs, angiotensin receptor blockers, can retard that process, retard uh, remodeling. So it's one of the, the mainstay in the treatment of heart failure, diabetic uh, nephropathy, and uh, hypertension. So what are some of the, 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 the adverse effects? of uh, angiotensin receptor blocker. You know, it can cause some dizziness, headache, hyperkalemia. So, because it's gonna block the, 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 the excretion of potassium, so you can get hyperkalemia. Orthostatic hypotension, that's when you stand up, the blood pressure falls quite a bit. Can give you a rash, uh, dyspepsia, myalgia, insomnia, renal impairment and angioedema, uh, angio swelling of the throat. Not so much as a, another class of medicine that we'll talk about, but you can get angioedema from the harp. So you have to know about harps. These are some of the harps, and um, uh, I'm pretty sure most of you guys have uh, come across patients taking these medicines. Losartan, uh, Candesartan, Valsartan, uh, herbisartan, termisartan, um, we use eprosartan to some extent, almisartan, and um, we don't use this much, but lasartan and valsartan, probably what you guys are familiar with. We have the, the trade name for these medicines, the half-life, the protein binding, the bioavailability, renal and hepatic clearance, uh, how food does affect these medicines. You can see food uh, doesn't, you so said you can, that means you can tell the patient they can take it at any time. They don't have to take the medication with food. And these are the dose that we, we usually um, recommend. So these are the ARBs, angiotensin receptor blockers. They sit on the receptor and prevent angiotensin II from producing its effect. We use it to treat hypertension, uh, diabetic ref, uh, nephropathy to prevent uh, kidney failure, and then heart failure. All right, so the next group of uh, medicines is the angiotensin converting enzyme in, in, in inhibitor. So just going back over the, this cascade, this, uh, remember, you have your angiotensinogen, which is uh, producing the liver. Then the renin, which is producing the kidney, it's going to convert this angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. And then angiotensin 1 will be converted to angiotensin 2 with ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme. So we're going to, we, we're going to look at medications that block this step, that's going to inhibit this enzyme. 
So you're not going to get angiotensin 1 going into angiotensin 2 to give, give you all these effects. So this ACE inhibitors block this enzyme here, whereas HARBs work, you know, right here on, on the, the, the receptors of the organs. Okay, so the mechanism of action of your angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, so it's going to inhibit this enzyme. It, it inhibits the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 by blocking angiotensin converting enzymes. So it's going to block the enzyme that converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. So remember, angiotensin 2 is the bad actor right here. <clears throat> so in essence, you'll get pretty similar results to the HARBs. <clears throat> so you're going to get the very similar results uh, as you would get with the, the angiotensin receptor blocker. You get vasodilatation, the blood vessel dilates, decreased production of aldosterone, and you get increased bradykinin and reduced vasopressin uh, levels. So how what we use ACE to treat, same thing as uh, your ARBs, hypertension, because it causes vasodilatation, diabetic nephropathy, it prevents uh, or retards kidney failure in diabetics, and we use it to treat congestive heart failure, which, of course, as we had mentioned before, it, it, it retards or inhibits uh, remodeling, and remodeling is a thinning and dilatation of the, the heart muscle. So patients who have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, these medications have been shown to reduce uh, mortality, say so decrease mortality in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and it also prevent worsening of uh, the, the, the ejection fraction. Uh, in some situation, it actually causes improvement in the ejection fraction. So patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, these group of medicines is of a class one indication. That means they should be prescribed and it's a malpractice if it's not prescribed, okay? So the, the ACE inhibitors, if the patient, all right, so these are some of the, the adverse effects of the ACE inhibitors. The hypotension, the blood pressure can fall tremendously. Cough, cough is sometimes a big problem with ACE inhibitors. And we com commonly discontinue the medication because of cough. It can cause hyperkalemia, so you have to be careful about that. Uh, if patients have renal failure, you have to be careful. They can cause uh, hyperkalemia. They get some headache, dizziness, fatigue, nausea. But this is another big one. So the big, the things that you have to remember about ACE inhibitors is the cough and angioedema. So if you start any of these medications and the patient and they tell you they have swelling, the difficulty in swallowing, you have to see them immediately because they may be having swelling in the throat, which can block off uh, the air passage and uh, you know, patient can die from that. So these are some of the, the common ACE inhibitors, benazepril, captopril, enalapril, fosinopril, lysinopril, uh, moexipril, uh, perindopril, quinopril, ramipril, and trandalopril. The ones that are um, in the ones that are in, in, in main circulations are used quite a bit is your enalapril, lysinopril, and ramipril to some ex extent. Uh, these are the equivalent dose, uh, the dose that you should start, uh, the usual dose in patients, and the maximum dose. So you should familiar with, familiarize yourself with, um, with, 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 with the common ones, okay? Of course, this is, again, enalapril, which is, uh, we call that vasotech, um, lysinopril, call that enal, uh, sorry, this is a lysinopril, um, and uh, quinopril and uh, ramipril. All right, <clears throat> so those are the ARBs and the ACE.
Now we come to beta blockers, uh, and beta blockers what we call beta adrenergic blocking agents or beta antagonists. So on on the the on the on the heart or in the heart, you have beta receptors, and in the vascular system, and all the system in in the lungs, you also have uh, beta receptors. So these are receptors that you know when hormones or drugs interact with these receptors, they produce effects. So. Uh, the, 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 the beta blockers on the heart um, so, or the beta receptors on the heart, if you stimulate them, if you stimulate the beta receptors, you can increase the contractility of the heart, the heart rate, mainly the heart rate. And the beta receptors on the blood vessels, when you... When you stimulate the beta receptors in the blood vessels, uh, there's a tendency to dilate the blood vessels, okay? So, um, so, so when, when we talk about beta blockers, you block the binding of endogenous catecholamine. These are hormones that usually act on these receptors. And the, 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 the the usual catecholamines are what we call epinephrine and, and uh, non-epinephrine um, type of um, uh, medication. So there are, there are usually about three types of uh, beta receptors. Uh, beta-1 is mainly in the heart and kidney. Beta-2, the lungs, gastrointestinal tract, liver, uterus, vascular, spoon muscle, and skeletal muscle, and beta-3 is in and, uh, the uh, fatty tissue. Again, we say when you stimulate beta-1 receptors, they, they is a tendency for the heart rate and contractility to go up a little bit. Uh, in the lungs, uh, beta two. When you stimulate the beta receptors, then the lungs will, you know, you you you, you, you get, you get um, bronchodilatation. So beta two agonist is a treatment for patients with uh, asthma because when you stimulate the beta receptors, it causes dilatation of the the bronchioles, and um, it's similarly in the 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 blood. The blood, um, the blood vessels. Okay. All right. All right. So, what are some of the medical uses for these beta blockers? Uh, usually, patients who presents with uh, what we call angina, um, that is chest pain or pain due to blockage of the blood vessel around the heart, angina pectoris. Atrial fibrillation because if patients has a, if the patient have a very rapid heartbeat, uh, these uh, beta blockers can slow. Remember we said that the the beta receptor causes uh, increase in the heart rate, um, so you can slow the heart rate by blocking the beta receptors. Also, some some other type of cardiac uh, arrhythmias, congestive heart failure. Um, beta blockers are very important in congestive heart failure because just like ACE inhibitors, uh, beta blockers have been shown to retard uh, or, or reduce remodeling, which is thinning and dilatation of the heart muscle. And studies have shown that beta blockers uh, uh, will reduce mortality and can increase ejection fraction in these patients with heart failure, which reduce ejection fraction. Essential tremors, um, we use it a lot for those patients. Um, hypertension, so hypertension is a big one, okay? So the, the so that, that migraine prophylaxis, that migraine headache, mitral valve prolapse, uh, we, use, we use it again in myocardial, in for patients with myocardial infarction because uh, we, we want to, Re reduce the heart rate when someone has an, a heart attack, myocardial infarction. We want, re we want to reduce the heart rate because increased heart rate can increase the, the, the size of the heart attack. And then not only that, it can, it, the beta blockers also reduce arrhythmias, abnormal rhythm. When someone gets a heart attack, they're prone to ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, and death. So the, the, the beta blockers help those um, patients. 
And again, when you get a heart attack, the heart muscle dies, so you, you tend to get remodeling, thinning and dilatation, and beta blockers and ACE inhibitors will, will re reduce remodeling. So beta blockers are a cornerstone in the treatment of patients with uh, what we call ischemic heart disease, coronary artery disease, any type of blockage, heart attack, angina, beta blockers are very important, okay? Um, anxiety, you know, it's common that patients gonna, you know, or individuals gonna give uh, a speech and they're a bit nervous, we give them, you know, we, they can take a beta blocker to help in that situation. Hyperthyroidism, patient has aortic dissection, hypertrophic, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. So there's a, a lot of use for, for our beta blockers. What are some of the, the adverse effects, the bad things about beta blockers? Nausea, diarrhea, bronchospasm is another big one. So patients who have asthma, bronchial asthma or COPD, be careful about the use of your beta blockers because remember we said the beta receptors will dilate the, 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 the bronchial smooth muscles. So we use, we use, um, we use uh, beta agonists, that is something that's going to sit on the, the beta receptors in, the, in the, the lungs to cause dilatation. So if you block it, it's going to cause constriction, okay? So uh, patients with asthma and COPD commonly or sometimes have bronchospasm. They start wheezing, so you have to be careful about that. And it can reduce the heart rate quite a bit, so the patient can become bradycardic. Sometimes they'll tell you they have cool digits, extremities, okay? And um, you can get uh, hypotension. This is supposed to be hypotension, because you can lower the blood pressure quite a bit. You can get heart failure, heart block, um, you know, abnormal uh, vision, hallucination, somnia nightmare, and erectile dysfunction. The common thing here is your bronchospasm, bradycardia, hypotension, a heart block, and heart failure, beta blockers. So these are some of the common beta blockers. We divide them into non-selective and selective. The non-selective, that would, they'll hack not only in the, the beta blockers in the heart, but all beta blockers elsewhere. Uh, so these are some of the non-selective. The common ones is carvetolol, uh, Coreg, um, labetalol to some extent, propranolol, sotolol. Uh, these are your non-selective beta blockers, okay? And then the selective beta blockers, they act mainly on the heart. We talk about beta-1 selective agents includes atenolol, bisoprolol, um, and metoprolol, okay? Um, so these uh, are the, the, the ones that we use uh, mostly. Atenolol, you're, we use esmolol to some extent, but metoprolol is used extensively. So these are beta-selective. They are mainly on the cardiac uh, beta receptors. What is the mechanism? So, um, so those are the beta blockers. So. Um, now we move to calcium channel blockers, and you know they they act on the calcium channels. So the mechanism of action of your calcium cal, calcium channel blockers uh, they disrupt the movement of calcium through channels. So in the in the cells, you, tend, you have these channels that allow calcium to to move freely. So it's going to disrupt the movement of calcium through these channels. And we have what you call the L-type voltage gated calcium channel uh, blocker. So it just block these specific type of um, calcium channels. So as a result of that, you get vasodilatation, the blood vessel dilates, uh, reduce the force of contraction uh, of the heart, and it decreases the heart rate as well. So we use these beta blockers to treat hypertension because it causes vasodilatation. Patients who come with angina, that is heart uh, chest pain because of blockage of the blood vessel around the heart and atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, you know, rapid heartbeats because it's slow, the heartbeat. So uh, we have, uh, we usually divide them into two main class 
uh, we call them the dihydropyridine type of calcium channel blocker. It reduces vascular uh, resistance, systemic vascular resistance, and it reduce um, arterial pressure. And then you have the non uh, dihydropyridine. So you have the, the hydropyridine, the dihydropyridine, and the non dihydropyridine. Um, the non dihydropyridine uh, reduce myocardial oxygen demand and uh, coronary and reverse coronary uh, vasospasm. Um, and then, you know, so you have uh, two types in the non dihydropyridine you have the phenyl alkaline phenyl alkaline amine, and then the benzothiazepine type. Um, the main difference between these, one of, uh, one will, will reduce the heart rate, okay, and one will not reduce the heart rate. So, you know, that's the main difference between your dihydropyridine and your non-dihydropyridine. The, the, the dihydropyridine includes what we call your 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 norvas or your amlodipine and um, and your 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 uh, nifedipine. Uh, then the non dihydropyridine includes your 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 uh, verapamil and your cardizem. These medicines tend to reduce the heart rate, and we use them to treat patients with rapid heart rhythm. So the adverse effects of your calcium channel blockers, dizziness, headache, it's a big one. Ankle edema is a big one. So it's very common patients who are taking cardizem and amlodipine and nifedipine tend to get uh, ankle edema, okay? Uh, of course, it can slow the heart rate. And then gingival overgrowth or gingival hypertrophy, that's the gum get very enlarged more common with your nifedipine type of medicines. So the the dihydropyridine group, okay, the dihydropyridine group uh, includes your Norvas amlodipine and your, um, the, the other one that we use commonly is your nifedipine or procardia, okay? So these dihydropyridine tends, they, 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 they don't produce much effect on the heart rate. So we will use these, we do not use these to treat patients with uh, rapid heart rhythm. The amlodipine, which is your Norvas, and your nifedipine, which is your procardia. Um, these don't affect the heart rate too much. And then your non-dihydropyridine, non of course, includes your verapamil, the other name for that is Kalen, isoptin, and your, your cardizem or diltazem. These medicines will, will not only will lower the blood pressure, but they will decrease the heart rate, verapamil and deltaism. So we use them. We use them to treat patients with rapid heart rhythm and hypertension. Okay. Uh, the next uh, medication we're going to look at is digoxin. So digoxin is used quite extensively in 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 medical practice especially in cardiology it's a relatively old medication um, the mechanism of action of, of digoxin it binds the sodium potassium atps pump in the membranes of heart cells and and as a result of that it decreases the function of the um the, the sodium potassium atps pump so there is this pump in the cell that is is transporting, you know, sodium resides mainly in, inside of cells, and potassium mainly outside of cells. So this pump, this pump is is responsible for maintaining the intracellular uh, sodium and extracellular potassium. So this pump is constantly uh, working in the cells. So digoxin inhibits the function of this pump. So as a result, it's gonna increase the level of sodium in the myocyte, which can lead to very high level of intracellular uh, calcium ions because the pump is not working. And if you look at your action potential, it, it, it lengthens phase four and phase zero of the cardiac action potential. 
uh, as a result of that, it decreased heart rate. So we, we use it for rapid heart rhythm as well, mainly atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter. So it decreased heart rate and it increased the contractility of the heart. So we patients who who had decreased uh, a heart rate, sorry, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, we we you know we used to use it for those patients because it increased contractility of the heart. Um, but one of the main use of the Jackson is for patients with atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter to decrease the um, heart rate. So heart failure, we, we use it because of it, it causes increased contractility. Atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, slow the, um, the, the ventricular response in those uh, patients. The adverse effects of the Jackson, when someone becomes digoxin toxic, um, we usually see this in older individuals. Uh, digoxin have what we call a very narrow therapeutic window. Narrow therapeutic window. That is the range between the, the effective treating uh, dose and the dose that you become toxic is very narrow. So a patient may be doing fine on whatever dose of digoxin and then you know, something happens, the kidney might fall off a little bit for whatever reason, they become toxic. And when, when they develop the digoxin toxicity, patient commonly tell you that they'll they, 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 they have a loss of appetite, they commonly nauseous, they'll vomit, they'll see these uh, yellow-green halos, blurred vision, and it's not uncommon to see some of these elderly patients who are cachectic they're, because it, they're not eating for a few weeks. They've lost a lot of weight, um, okay? They can also become confused, dizzy, insomnia. Um, you can get what we call atrial tachycardia with block. It's very common, or biventricular tachycardia. Uh, sorry, uh, right, biventricular tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia. The more, which is more specific for digoxin, is the, the biventricular tachycardia and bigemony. So these are some of the adverse effects of digoxin. I said the common one is when patients become toxic, they lose their appetite, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, weight loss, this yellow, green, halo, uh, they can become confused. The rhythm that is somewhat not not 100% specific, but it's very suggestive of digoxin toxicity, atrial tachycardia with block and biventricular uh, tachycardia. Uh, digoxin was very, very, uh, it, its use was uh, very popular a few years ago. Uh, the use have been uh, reduced somewhat because there are studies that shows that there is increased mortality with um, digoxin especially if it's the range, the, the, the level is elevated. Um, okay. Nitroglycerin, we use nitroglycerin quite ex extensively in, 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 in cardiology. Um, the mechanism of action of nitroglycerin uh, cause vasodilatation, so it dilates the arterial and venous system. So as a result, it decreases systemic vascular resistance. So the blood vessels around the heart gets enlarged. And so if someone presents with angina, one of the first thing we'll do, you know, after we do the vital signs is to give them sublingual nitroglycerin because it will dilate the blood vessel around the heart and reduce uh, your angina chest pain due to blockage. Um, the, 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 when, you, when you give uh, your nitroglycerin, it, um, it forms nitric oxide, and then nitric oxide activates guanine cyclase. This is on the surface of the cells. So the, the nitric oxide activates your guanine cyclase, and you get an increase of your cyclic GMP in smooth muscle, and that's what causes the vascular smooth muscle dilatation. So we use it to treat angina, hypertension, chronic heart failure. So, so again, you know, I had a patient two days ago, the blood pressure was 200 and whatever over, 
uh, hundred and something, the patient was post-op. They had a surgery, so you can't give them anything oral. Uh, so I had to revert to intravenous nitroglycerin to lower the pressure because they cannot take anything oral. Okay, so intravenous nitroglycerin, we use it for angina, and then for chronic heart failure, we also use it. What are some of the adverse effects of nitroglycerin? Very important, you'll get a headache. Some patient would tell you they have severe headaches once they take either sublingual nitroglycerin or the longer acting nitroglycerin, severe headaches. They can get vertigo, weakness, palpitation, nausea, vomiting, weakness, pallid diaphoresis, and collapse, syncope. So it's not uncommon, I have a, you know, a lot of these older patients, anything happened to them, they're gonna take a sublingual nitroglycerin but it lowers the blood pressure. So it's not uncommon for these patients, they have a little chest discomfort, they take a sublingual nitroglycerin and then they pass out. Okay, I've seen a lot of cases because it lowered the blood pressure and they have a syncopal episode, so be careful about that. But the common adverse effect is the headache um, and uh, your, your nausea vomiting. All right, uh, so the types of nitroglycerin includes just sublingual. So a patient comes with chest pain, you give them a sublingual nitroglycerin, you can give them, you know, we usually recommend every five minutes, three doses. If they're still having chest pain, then you do something else. You can give the longer acting um, a, a nitroglycerin, is your uh, isosorbide mononitrate, and the shorter acting isosol by dinitrate. So you'll, you'll dose this two or three times or even four times a day, whereas your mononitrate is usually once daily, okay? And then your intravenous nitroglycerin, we use to treat uh, patients with heart failure, hypertension, stuff like that. Um, so we, we're gonna stop here. Um, and um, our next session, we'll do antiarrhythmic drugs, um, uh, chemotherapeutic uh, agents that affect the heart uh, muscles. Um, we'll look at uh, oxygen. Uh, then we'll look at your, your morphine, your, your Valium, your ketamine. All right.